Hi, welcome to Frederick County Public Library's virtual programming for adults and families. My name is Ralph, and today I'm going to discuss with you a little bit about uh, the typical uh, arms and equipment and uniforms of a Civil War soldier. So, so here we have a volunteer who is uh, equipped in basic uniform of a typical federal infantry soldier of the time of the American Civil War. They were issued a hat, which is called a kepi. It's a French word, um, and it's not terribly functional, but it was, as you can see, it's got a little extra room in the top, uh, and so it, so it slants forward. And it is, um, it's, it is uh, the model uh, that the military chose at that time period. Uh, on here, we have, this is an eight-button frock coat, which would, of course, be buttoned up when worn. Uh, we're having it open so you can see. Uh, the blue piping stands for infantry. If it was red, it would mean they served in the artillery. And if it was yellow, it would mean they served in the cavalry. So that was a help, a distinctive um, piping to indicate which branch of the service you were in. Underneath the frock coat, soldiers typically wore vests, uh, different sorts. Uh, this is just another... Um, blue one, uh, it's typical with the uh, Union blue, and it's got three pockets, uh, this would be a watch pocket, and um, and underneath the shirts were not issued by the army, so shirts had to either be bought, given, or uh, sent to the soldiers, usually, typically from home. Family at home would, would hand spin uh, wool and cotton, and they would make shirts, and they'd send them to their boys in the field. And then, down here we have the uh, issue sky blue wool trousers held in place by suspenders, or braces as they were called. They go up over the shoulder and connect in the back. And what we have here are a pair of uh, army issued brogans, or boots. Uh, they were modeled after what was called the Jefferson Pattern Bootie. It's an ankle length boot, you can see. And oftentimes soldiers would have heel plates nailed into their heel. It's just a, it's like a little miniature horseshoe, and they would be nailed into their heel to help prolong the life of the boot. Uh, these would often fall off, and they make slippery walking in wet conditions, uh, but it did help the shoe, the boot, have a longer lifespan. And they were issued in lefts and rights, which was uh, something relatively new at the time of the Civil War. Um, so that's uh, an example of what the soldiers wore and marched many, many hard miles in um, on both sides. And they were actually quite valuable, and soldiers depended on them, needed them, and they were um, coveted items. So this is a uh, typical uh, backpack or knapsack uh, issued to soldiers. It's basically um, tarred canvas to make it water resistant. I wouldn't say it's waterproof. And this is what it looks like from the, the outward facing side. And this is what the soldier had against his back. And this strap would go here. And, and off you go marching to wherever it was they sent you. So let's see what's inside. Hi, and welcome back. Uh, I am laying down in this strange looking tent behind me. Uh, it's called a shelter half. Each soldier would be issued one half of this tent and the two men would get together and button the top together and they would form a two man sleeping tent on a typical uh, campaign march uh, in the field. This is what soldiers slept in. Uh, the, the wooden cross beam and the stakes could be cut from any local trees, uh, and typically we would have some sort of peg holding down the four corners or six corners if it was windy. Uh, and also you'll notice I'm laying on that aforementioned rubber sheet. 
to help keep them due and, and bugs off of me at night. So what we have next are some personal items that soldiers typically would carry, and I'm going to open up my haversack. This Again, it's a tarred canvas bag to make it water resistant, not waterproof, and I'll show you some of the things that are inside. So this bag was issued for the soldiers' rations. Uh, in, on a typical campaign, uh, a soldier would be issued three days of rations uh, consisting of things like coffee, coffee beans, tied up in a sack. Uh, they would be issued uh, dehydrated beans, dry beans that they could reconstitute. They'd be issued maybe some dried peas for uh, to keep to keep them fresh. And what Civil War soldier wouldn't be at home without hardtack? Hardtack is a, a basic uh, long shelf life bread, the army bread, and I have a box that I'll show you in a minute that the typical um, that units were issued. Uh, it's simply flour, water, and salt with some holes poked in it and baked until hard, as you can hear. And they ate a lot of hardtack. Uh, they, they would recommend, looks like I got an extra ration. They would recommend soaking these in coffee or water or boiling them uh, in whatever you might be cooking around a campfire to help soften them up. Sometimes the soldiers would take the butts of their muskets and smash them and crush them into crumbles and throw them in with um, bacon or anything else they had um, found from the countryside, which was called foraging. The soldiers would go foraging, meaning they'd visit neighborhood farms, towns, and they would procure food that way, um, not always by the farmer's choice. <laughs> Basically, they found food where they could and they took it. And that's, what, that's often how the army ate because the rations, as you can see, were not that great. I also have a little bag of rice just to round out that healthy Civil War diet. Uh, typical cutlery they might carry. Uh, you'll note these knives don't have points on them because they would tend to poke through the material of the haversack. And so they had rounded edges to keep from damaging their, um, their bag. And just a fork. And more coffee. This is an example of an army bread box. I showed you the hardtack earlier. Uh, the army bread was produced in cities uh, throughout the, the country. Uh, this one is marked uh, army bread from the Union Mechanical Baking Company in Baltimore, Maryland. And the hardtack would be stacked up inside of these boxes and shipped via train or wagon to troops in the field. And that's how soldiers would receive one of the staples of army life, which is hardtack. Aim, fire. What we have here are some things that the government really cared about, which was the equipment which facilitated a soldier's ability to fight in battle. And they consisted of the rifle, the rifled musket. The government issued you with a cartridge box. Again, it's marked U.S. It has here... This is called a breastplate. It's a holdover from other armies and other uh, times, uh, which helped connect cross straps on the soldier on the soldier's chest. It c became more of a, a symbol, and it was it was more there for identity uh, and and part of the uniform that it actually had function. But it's got the uh, eagle emblazoned upon it, and inside the cartridge box, which is c connected with this flap here is where your ammunition was kept. 
normally. Uh, when they first, when the four first started, there were two tin inserts that went in here. Each side, each tin carried approximately 20 rounds of ammunition. The tins were cumbersome and were quickly discarded by soldiers, and they kept cartridges loose in this box. This box has a double flap to help keep water out, and the actual box plate does form a purpose in that it helps give some weight to this flap, so if a soldier is moving quickly, running through a field, the flap's not opening up and his cartridges are spilling out all over the ground. Inside here, a soldier would carry cartridges. This one's partially disassembled, so you can see what it is. It would be a paper cartridge filled with black powder. This is just sand. And it would have loaded a mini ball, a 58 caliber mid-lead ball that's conical in shape. Inside the cartridge box, the soldier would carry his cartridges. The lead ball would be inserted inside this paper tube, which would have black powder in the bottom of it and that would be torn open with his teeth and poured down the barrel of this rifle. And I'm going to show that demonstration in the next piece. Around his waist, the soldier wore a, a belt. Again, U.S. belt buckle, since we're talking about the Union Army here, or the Federals. This is called a cat box. It's got the manufacturer's stamp on the front. This cat box slips up, and again, it's got a double flap to help the caps from flying out. And inside is a little brass cap, kind of shaped like Abe Lincoln's hat. It's filled with a drop of fulminate of mercury. When the cap is placed onto the rifle, it explodes, causing the cartridge to discharge out the end of the rifle. And I'm going to show you that in just a few minutes. Also, on his belt, soldier was issued a bayonet. So this is a long pointy piece of metal that affixes to the end of the rifle and was used sometimes in combat but not terribly often as the weapons and tactics of the time had changed to the point where bayonet charges which were more common in say the American Revolutionary War became a much less frequent occurrence as soldiers tended not to get that close to each other. Hi, this is the musket firing demonstration part of the program. The round I will be firing is not live, it's simply a blank round. So it's a nine step process to load and fire this Civil War era rifled musket. This one's a reproduction, it's approximately 40 years old. It's a nine step process and I will run through that and for you and load a simulated round and you'll see what happens. The first command to begin the process is given by the officer or NCO in charge, and it is prepare to load in nine times. Load. The weapon is brought down between my feet and put away at an angle, and my hand goes to the cartridge box and unfastens it. The next command is handle cartridge. A paper cartridge filled with black powder and a lead mini ball is taken out and brought up to the side of the soldier's mouth. The next command is tear cartridge. This the cartridge is torn with my teeth and brought down next to the edge of the barrel for the next command, which is charge cartridge. The black powder is poured down the barrel, and at this point, if there were a round here, it would be placed right here for the next stage, which is to seat the bullet. The next command is draw rammer. The ramrod is removed, turned over, so the cup end would fit on top of the, the round. The next command is ram cartridge. The ramrod is forced down, pushing the black powder a wad and the lead ball seated at the bottom of the weapon. The next command is return rammer. The ramrod is removed and placed back here and returned to the base. The next command is prime. The weapon is brought up. The foot drops back at a right angle, and the hammer is brought back to half cock. A small brass percussion cap is pulled from the cap box and placed on the weapon like that. The weapon is now primed, loaded, and ready for firing. The next command is ready. The hammer is brought all the way back. Aim. Fire. 
shoulder, arm. And that's the Civil War load and nine times procedure.